All right, guys, we're live. That was a great panel by David. Thank you for the shout out at the end of the panel. I'm really excited for this next discussion on the future of digital identity and blockchain technology. And the Futures Conference has really gathered some amazing experts in the industry for this panel. Let me start by introducing myself. I am Ashton Addison, CEO of Event Chain and host of the Crypto Coin Show on YouTube, as well as broadcaster on Reuters Insider Financial Network. And I'm pleased to be joined today with some amazing guests who I will introduce. Uh, Joseph Weinberg, the co-founder of Shift Network, a credentials verification platform that authenticates sender identities and unlocks economies of trust. As well, Toli Kivnitsky, the VP of growth at Truly You, which has the ability to uh, verify 4 billion people in the world, over 50 countries. And it's a hyper growth startup from Vancouver. Glad to be repping Canada. Welcome Tolly. And as well, RJ Riser, the chief business development officer of Cabin Network. Cabin Network empowers users to manage and control their digital identities and their sensitive data through biometrically secured liquid avatars and KYC and AML validation through their cabin ID. So I'm very excited. Welcome gentlemen to the panel. Great, thank, thank you. you for having us. Thank you. All right, guys, Great. let's dive right in because we have a limited amount of time and a lot of topics to cover. Uh, I first wanna start out by just talking about digital identity and cryptocurrency exchanges. And then my first question is, there's many different major cryptocurrency exchanges that are global, for example, Binance Global, and they're onboarding customers from Canada, but also from emerging countries around the world in all of these different countries outside of the US. Now, your networks working with these exchanges as well as VASPs, which we will probably mention quite a bit in this discussion, which is a virtual asset service provider, you're helping provide digital identities and verification to these exchanges. And each of these countries have different AML, KYC, anti-money laundering, know your customer identity regulations. How do you work together with these exchanges when each country has different regulations? Obviously, Canada might be a little bit more, more uptight than Nigeria and these other countries around the world, and it's a big kerfuffle. So I, I want to kick it off by asking Joseph uh, your you know detail on this situation. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we kind of like took this approach in the, in the long view is that like, as you know, adoption started to come, there'd be this co-integration requirement. And, and, and I think the, and we're starting to really see that today in the space. Uh, and, and we, you know, we were doing a lot of work with the financial action task force and trying to define, you know, what are the rules and, and how do we make those work? Um, and how do you not look at redeveloping SWIFT, right? And, and when you think about, the requirements today in the ecosystem that's effectively what's being built. And so um, the way we look at it is that, you know, in order to solve the counterparty uh, discovery challenges that you have and the ability to onboard identities and users and how you express those, um, you really need to take a blockchain focused approach, right? So um, just in the same way as you're onboarding a user, you're identifying that user based on the same key principles, which is public addresses represent users, counterparties, they act as a form of identification. And then how you express or translate that across those counterparties uh, is kind of a different you know, topic, I would say. Uh, but it's really what you're trying to solve with VASPs. And so today we've been working with the largest global exchanges uh, that represent probably 75% or more of, of global liquidity and trying to, you know, get them through this process, understand how this works. And, and it requires a network that is adaptable um, to global or jurisdictional requirements, right? Not every country is the same as you say. And so you need a flexible system, uh, which is really what shift been building that allows us to say, wherever you are, we can discover who you are, who your user is, and then allow them to conform to those data sharing or data standard requirements based on a GDPR complex as well. Uh, it's a multifaceted problem. Yeah, it's quite a large problem. And um, Toli, do you have anything to add to that? Because I know you're also working with a lot of different uh, providers in different areas. 
Yeah. So, so you know, cryptocurrencies um, and you know decentralized business models, I think, are the first vertical that we've seen that start global from the get-go, borderless, like from the jump. Like every other client industry that we work with, you know, they go country by country. You know, start with one, go to two. While cryptocurrency, it you know, which ones can't we do? Right. You start off with 50, 100. So the way that we recommend, you know, especially to ones that launch with 50, 80 countries is highlight a country that, that has really, you know, really great guidelines. Canada is a great example. Like FinTrack really defines what AML and KYC is. And it's pretty strict and it's a really great starting point, actually. You know, just to rep our Canadian roots uh, on this panel. So a really good place to start is what is a requirement to verify an identity in Canada and where can you replicate that process in 45, 50 countries? And in our experience, you're going to cover 90 plus percent of AML and KYC requirements by picking something difficult and, you know, and, and forward looking as far as, you know, government guidelines go. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. And Audrey Right. I mean, it, it's lowest common denominator. We we run all of our process through at a GDPR level. Um, every every transaction sooner or later is going to end up back in into one of these countries. There's some connection somewhere, and they're going to require, based on the existing regulations, that they go through that standard. So we we hold everyone up to that GDPR level. Um, and just one other thing. You know, I always try to find an easy way to explain what we're doing with identity and blockchain. And the easiest way to explain it, like especially to my children, is it solves the double spend problem. Blockchain solved the double spend problem for Bitcoin. We're doing the same thing for individuals. Double spend is the fraud, right? We, we solve that. That's the easiest way to explain it. It obviously gets more complicated um, and there's additional things that you got to do, but it solves the double spend problem. Mm -hmm. Very well said. And now <clears throat> I want to talk about the regulatory compliance and the burden, which actually is supposed to fall on the exchanges and not the customers. And the exchanges and BASCs have to sort of balance acquiring quality information and as much information as they can to verify, you know, is this person who we said they are? while also ensuring that the customers don't have to go through you know, two weeks worth of filling out paperwork and, and essentially ensuring a quick and painless registration to an exchange or whatever it will be so that they can start sending their funds uh, as soon as they can. Uh, can you talk about that balance? Ashton, who do you want to kick off with this one? <laughs> Let's start with Holly. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to volunteer, but yeah, sure. So let's, uh, uh, you know, I, as, as I, let me speak from a user perspective, not a true perspective to start. So let's just get out, to get this out of the way. Um, you know, putting like an ID next to your face, holding up like a signed document doesn't meet AML KYC and it's an awful UX experience. So I'm glad to see that more times now exchanges are not doing. But when I signed up, that's what I had to do and date and sign like, you know, virtual show of hands if anyone else has had to do that a couple dozen times. Um, yep, ditto. So so, and employees do it, you know, on top of that, right? So you have a 24, 48 hour, if you're lucky, waiting period to get onboarded. So the way that, you know, users are, are used to with the UX is forms, right? Information about yourselves. And then, you know, things like, I think, uh, Joseph, you mentioned this, like address, location, you know, things things that we're used to sharing, you know, whether we're signing up to, not that it's a, you know, apples to apples comparison, but another financial service. Um, it's, it's still applicable the same laws are applicable, applicable to exchanges as well. And then if more is needed, um, you know, risk-based approaches, there are flags. If shift network is like, hey, there's something fishy about this one, like then it goes into the manual review process. So so that's that's how um, that's how we recommend uh, generally to do it. And that's how that's how we help our clients meet meet the regulations and manage UX on top of that. Mm -hmm. And RJ, do you have anything to add? Oh yeah, lots. It's space is moving fast, right? So, what the approach that Cabin took instead of doing one off, our KYC and AML is constant; it's always on. So when they sign up with us, we're constantly monitoring it, and then notifying the exchange or whoever the entity is that requested it of any issues with AML or when they have to update it, the ninety-day window or, or what have you. So it's not just one-offs. 
Uh, what's interesting is, is that with the products that we're rolling out is, is that we're consumer facing. So that now we'll have that relationship with the consumer, lock in their, their, their KYC, and then they can port that KYC to any of the vendors that are in our ecosystem. So uh, the, the step, the number one step for us to approach it, we've done a lot of research on this. Uh, we've had a press release that just went out today that we have joined as the steering committee to the trust over IP, which is a four layer uh, structure that will provide the self-sovereign identity, which we can probably talk to talk about that for hours. Um, and we think that's the foundation for moving forward so that it's not always one off, repeat, rinse, do it again. You own your identity. You know, Cabin believes that you know, it's a basic human right to own your own identity online. And the days of an anonymous internet are over. Right, and uh, we're, we're pushing this, this forward. There's a large group, I mean, everybody on this call, it, there's, it, it's moving so quickly that I believe it's a, it's a new paradigm shift. I spent my whole career trying to find a paradigm shift, and I think we found it here with this identity and some blockchain. Mm -hmm. Joseph, do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, so like, yeah, like we're not a verification, you know, project you know shift is very much focused on on kind of core let network layer infrastructure and so um i think the work that um that, that that everyone else on the call does today is really what you know precursors what shift is and mm -hmm. I, I mean i think I, I agree a lot with um with both panelists right now in that like i think that this is a definitely a paradigm shift and and what i find interesting is that like we can utilize regulations and this is kind of the way we've thought about this entire thing is like we can use regulations and we can build protocols and regulatory specific infrastructure that actually does better than how regulation and policy function today um and, and so i would just add that like that's kind of the approach that we've taken is like we can actually do better than the way that you know the traditional systems function and we can reduce risk and create you know changes in how counterparty dynamics work um, and that ultimately empowers more identity and credential creation and, and ownership and, and collateral control. Um, and it also actually is what the exchanges are looking at is I think the bootstrapping of a centralized identity system across the, the blockchain space. So how do you use a protocol layer, layer to enable uh, identity and credit and, and new types of formats? Uh, and we're kind of utilizing this, this kind of fat of KYC paradigm as a way to bootstrap a wider kind of conversation, so. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. and. One of the biggest paradigm shifts it seems in the industry and the hottest topic of 2020 has been decentralized finance and DeFi and decentralized exchanges like Uniswap. And I can't go through this discussion without at least mentioning it uh, because you know there's not really any AML KYC on a lot of these decentralized exchanges. Users can create liquidity pools and trade coins without potentially providing any ID or source of funds. So I wanna ask you to start Joseph are your networks watching the decentralized exchanges, working towards any potential uh, solutions with regards to identity or more so with regards to identifying black market funds and similar black market activity on these unregulated exchanges? Yeah, um, so Sh Shift was built as an on-chain compliance identity and compliance primitive routing system. And so we start with the exchanges because we recognize that you're a source of identity aggregation and consent. We haven't announced this yet, but we will be probably in the next month or so that we're working with some of the largest DeFi projects in the space today, actually, on how you look at uh, effectively the rollout or implementation of a global whitelisting system. So the idea that DeFi applications could allow opt-in um, compliance requirements to be uh, a function of all DeFi applications today uh, and using it as an advantage as opposed to saying it's only to uh, you know, solve counterparty risk, but it's more about how do you enable new types of lending or credit market creation, mm -hmm. like the, the fact that you have an identity persistent across all of these attributions uh, in DeFi is I think one of the most extraordinary things that will come in the next 12 months. Um, the idea that you have compliant liquidity pools that are functioning across you know, exchanges like Uniswap or being able to transmit uh, users across these and building credibility and reputational characteristics across these are probably I think where the space is going. And yeah, we're working on that currently. So. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. And do you guys have any other comments on that? 
Um, I have a comment just for Joseph. I think it's so applicable, especially when the travel rule will start to be enforced more and more. I think things like this are needed, you know, without having to re-verify people over and over again in certain cases. So I think it's, I think it's good. I'm looking forward to the announcements. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, my, my quick two cents on it is that everyone will start to move over to be regulated. The minute your net worth gets to a level you're afraid you're going to lose it, mm -hmm. you're not going to risk the potential of running a, uh, any kind of an exchange or transfer of money that might make you responsible where you now lose your net worth. So when it's starting and, and you don't have you know, a lot of net worth, you're able to run all these networks, it's not a big deal. When you start getting a, a, a pretty good cap on that work, the company's worth a lot of money. You are not going to subject your company to that potential risk. So I think it's all going to come out on itself. Definitely. And when you have the more net worth you have, the more you care about your personal digital identity. And <clears throat> I want to talk about exposing your personal information. You know, when you do register for all these different service providers, you do have to have some kind of verification where you need to show them your identity and they need to be able to derive that digital identity without exposing the information in a potentially way where it can be you know, taken advantage of, um, or at least have the customers know that you know, their information isn't gonna be hacked by sending it to this service provider so that they can start using their service. Uh, Joseph, can you talk about the, the balance there where to give that peace of mind to the customers where you know, you're, you're providing your information, but ensuring that it's not hackable? Yeah, it's kind of a delicate balance, right? And, and compliance has this issue where like compliance implies the, the requirement of centralized control of custody, right? So like it depends which parts of identity, like when you move, uh, let's say away from the compliance side for a minute, um, I do think things like Filecoin and, and these ideas that you have permanent file storage capabilities or the ability to, you know, deploy shards of data files across things is, is really interesting. Um, and I think that uh, in highly regulated environments, if you're talking about government identity systems and et cetera, you know, governments have been, I'll call it fairly okay at storing data. Um, and if we can provide, you know, less, um, you know, less data across more places, the idea that you can just spread those attributes into more places, I think is the, the ultimate, you know, goal. Um, so that it's, yes, I'm, you know, things are still hackable. Security is kind of an obfuscation tactic. Nothing is truly secure, but the more places we have more things and the less honey pots, I think that, um, you know, we have just a, an easier, you know, uh, a future ahead of us. So. Mm -hmm. RJ. Yes. Um, you know, this isn't an absolute, right? But it's rapidly approaching uh, in the fact that the government will be issuing a verified credential. That verified credential is supported from, uh, you know, an ID layer on top, a DID layer on top of the blockchain, where you make the data almost worthless to hack or steal. Because the minute I have my credential, and Ontario is working on this right now, the minute I have my credential, and, and they, as an issuer, um, issue that credential on top of blockchain to me as a holder, and I go to a verifier, they point back down, and unless they can see the private key from the issuer and also the holder, you can have that information. You can't do anything because you don't have the private key. It's like, just like looking at blockchain, I can see your, 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 your Bitcoin, right? But I can't move it or touch it or do anything with it because I, I don't have the private key. It's mm -hmm. the same thing with, with that they're moving forward with, with a verified credential. So another open standard is W3C, which is a verified credential in the trust triangle. That is one of the layers that we're leveraging inside of trust over IP, which is another open source foundation from Linux, uh, Linux foundation. Um, and only the governments are starting to identify this to say, not only do we have to protect data, because there's always data you gotta protect, but let's put it in a format where it's not worth hacking and stealing. You can take my information, but if you don't have the private key, you can't touch it. And, mm -hmm. and Aries is the agent that's, that from IBM that's gonna allow you to manage some of the, those aspects of it. So it, it again, I mean, it, it's moving fast, exciting. There's all kinds of neat little ecosystems that are popping up. Um, and you got to make it so it's not worth trying to hack or steal. Definitely. Uh, well, so 
you mentioned a couple things there. You mentioned the Ontario government and government digital identities, which I'm going to jump into. But first of all, you also mentioned integrating the blockchain and ensuring that you can see, you know, you can see somebody's address, but to have the private key and the access to actually utilize it is another story. And, you know, I, I've spoke about this with Joseph, uh, you know, last year, but I want to touch on it in, in terms of the blockchain part of the digital identity. There are people have that thought process where if you put information on the blockchain, you know, sometimes uh, if it's an immutable blockchain, then it can't be removed and it potentially could be public if it's a public blockchain. So can you guys talk about when you utilize the blockchain, but also verifying people's personal information, uh, is that information actually on the blockchain or you're just using the blockchain uh, as a service, but that information can be removed for compliance purposes and to know that your information isn't on the blockchain forever and it could be accessed by somebody? I, you guys want me to I jump in? All right, Go so ahead, just at a high level, this is just a high level, right? Is that you're using the cryptography to, to prove that you own a credential. So let's say the Ontario government would write to the blockchain their data set. So all the data that's on an ID, so name, it wouldn't put any name. There's no PII on the blockchain. As a verifier, you would look at the blockchain to say this is the structure of their data set of their verified credential. And I have one of those credentials. The PII is sitting in my agent. It's not sitting in the block in, in the blockchain. But we're using the blockchain so that the verifier can point to it and say these are the items and that there's a signature that says through crypto uh, graph um, that I have this ID and that information is accurate. Mm -hmm. um, it, that is a high level way to put it. And so no PII is ever on the blockchain. Yeah. Great. Joseph, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think that's like completely true. Like you never put PII anywhere near a blockchain. It's really like you're using it as a reference point. You're using it as a, I have some sort of a reference. They have pointing certain sets of and you have the ability to go to request to access that data. It's just, it's acting as a directory function across a variety of different use cases. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, my next question is, from your network's perspective, is there a chance of an Equifax-like hack that targets VASPs or exchanges where people's personal information could be stolen in, in aggregate? And how do your networks mitigate that? Um, I can I can jump in I can jump in on this one. So um, it, it is it is definitely a, a concern, and it was a concern when we truly started our marketplace of identity verification data um, services. So we took the approach that we actually don't store any PII. Um, we, we, we do the verification, we send the encrypted data back to our client, and then that's it. You know, we don't store the PII. So we probably took the, you know, a really, um, you know, far, far uber safe approach to PII, but just not touching it nor storing it and then with their from our clients perspective um we don't allow reusability and, and things like that so if you know if if we did something on behalf of a client and they verified ashton you know it's not going to have truly use you know stamp of approval that then gets hacked or anything like that so mm -hmm. we don't um yeah so we we probably take a super privacy focused approach and and you know lo and behold you know we complied with every privacy policy in the world before they even were enacted so but but one one approach um, from a security and verification company mm -hmm. joseph yeah i mean shift is again like kind of a lower layer like we don't touch any data um we implement a concept called a trust anchor trust anchors store data however they choose to um, however they choose to manage that data is up to their own requirements. Um, and it's only the way that they express that information on behalf of users and how consent permissioning and provisioning works across uh, a set of use cases. So we don't touch data or ever know any data that exists. Mm -hmm. so. That's good. RJ, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, it's the key. You got to minimize your risk. You don't, you don't pull unnecessary PII if, if you don't need it. And uh, you know, hashed and, and 
and cryptographically protected. And you mm -hmm. put the control in, in with the owner. It's, you don't have the control, the, the actual user, and they can go to the level that they're most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, I want to jump into the question about the government, which you had mentioned, RJ. Um, for the people that haven't seen the news, uh, starting in January 2021, the Ontario government is consulting with the industry, which is you guys, uh, on how the province can introduce a secure digital identity uh, online or in person. And eventually we won't be having to carry around driver's license cards, uh, government IDs, and it will all be online, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so how is this government verification going to be different uh, than working with VASPs and cryptocurrency exchanges and, and the regular bodies that your companies have worked with? RJ, if you could start. Okay, sure. So um, it's not going to be different, right? I mean, verifying it. So if you look at a verified credential, if you're trying to do business, the first step you do is identity. So it's, the identity piece is always going to be the same. Let's, let's validate and verify who the individual is. Then from there, you're gonna to go to whatever the business processes is. And you'll build an ecosystem that has its own governance that'll, that'll will address it. So if you look at all the verified credentials as those two pieces, identity first, and then what the business case is, um, you need to, in my opinion, right, you need a, a technology stack that there isn't one point of failure. You need a scenario where there's not a central authority that now is tracking you. So when we talked earlier about that trust triangle and why it sits on the blockchain is when, when a verifier goes to verify an ID from the issuer, the issuer never sees it. It shouldn't make sense. I, mean, I always make the joke that, that I don't want the government to know every time I go to buy a drink. They don't need to know that I buy drink 365 times a year, right? So, so it, it, this ID will verify back and the issuer of that ID will never be able to track it and know how often I use it. And that is one of the core foundations that Ontario is looking at is that you want to make sure that the user owns their identity and that nobody's tracking it. There can't be a central authority that manages it, tracks it, or even sells that data to another third party. Mm -hmm. Well said. Joseph, do you have anything to add? I know you're yeah. familiar with the Ontario jurisdiction. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think it's it's to be discovered how Ontario chooses to implement. I assume it will be, yes. Oh, we lost you there, Joseph. Oh, no. There we go. My God back yep oh oh no sorry guys oh, no. Uh, i apologize um yeah if, if you guys can still hear me um yep. yeah yep yeah so um i can say that like on the we, we we've been working on a project with the bermuda government and 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 it's really the same implementation standard pretty much everywhere right um you run a standard credential you're basically uh, the, who is that credential provider is really based on who the first users are. Um, but yeah, you're running a W3C credential standard. Um, it gives interoperability. It gives openness. Uh, it's probably the right architecture that I think most governments will choose. Um, and uh, I think British Columbia has already done this as well as Alberta, actually. And I think that they're on a pretty good path towards this. So I just see a universalized standard on how this works today. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Agree 100%. Awesome. Well, we're running out of time, guys, but I do want to ask you the final question. Uh, with regards to digital identity industry, uh, with exchanges and VASPs, but also with uh, the government discussion that we've been having here, uh, what is your futurist prediction uh, for the industry for August 2021 20, or uh, September 2021 of next year, the next 12 months? Uh, Tolly, go ahead first. Yeah, I, I think it's something that Joseph said that there'll be a a consistent layer of identity across any exchange. Like one exchange the, to the 13th exchange will all start looking the same when it comes to UX and requirements as far as onboarding goes. Mm -hmm. Great. And Joseph? 
Yeah, I would agree with that. I think you'll start to see very naturally produced primitives that come into the DeFi space and, and really start to make sense from a credit creation perspective. Uh, and I think that there'll be this unification and kind of co-integration between centralized exchanges and finance and the, using this kind of compliance layer as a way to start to enable a very wide adoptive capability um, between CFI and DeFi in the traditional world. So that's what I'm excited about. Mm -hmm. Exciting times. And RJ? I think there's going to be a consolidation of standards to be able to prove your identity online. And, and you'll see um, a, a lot of open source nonprofit utilities that will roll out different ecosystems, whether it's for verification for doctors when they go into a hospital, all the way to, you know, credentials to prove that you have a degree from a university. And I think that's mm -hmm. the low hanging fruit. We're going to see those, uh, proliferate and really take off in the next six to eight months. Well, we'll see what happens. And hopefully I see you guys back here at Futurist 2021 and hopefully in person as well in Toronto at the nightclub. Uh, let's all hope for that. Or do it. Yes. Thank you guys. Uh, it's been an honor to speak with you guys. Uh, all the best in your industry moving forward. Thank you so much to the Futurist Conference and Untraceable for hosting day two. It's been a wonderful conference and we'll see you guys in the next panel. Thank you.